You know, there was a point in time when the name Squaresoft carried a lot of weight to it. Sure, nowadays we associate these guys with long development cycles, NFTs, and publishing a lot of bad games. And I mean some real bad games, like major stinkers here. Not you though, you're pretty good. Which is funny, because back in the day, these guys were industry juggernauts. The Final Fantasy series is iconic, and it was their contribution to the RPG genre that solidified them as legendary developers. However, in the Stone Ages, this genre was a little on the niche side. Sure, Japan was eating good with a seemingly never-ending series of releases, but over here in the West, our options were limited to say the least. But that all changed back in 1997, when a little indie gem was released for the PlayStation. You've probably never heard of it. Oh, would you look at that? It seems as though the industry just changed overnight. Playing through this game felt like a blockbuster. The hardware of the PlayStation was pushed to its limits, but back then, you weren't finding anything else on this level. Final Fantasy VII's success isn't something to be understated. It got plenty of people back in the day to try out a genre that they otherwise would have ignored, and skyrocket JRPGs into the mainstream. But the most insane part about all of this is that Square was able to keep up with the demand. Only a year after FF7, we got Final Fantasy VIII, and only a year after that, we got IX, and that's not even counting some of the spin-off games. Sure, we can debate the quality of these games all we want, but we just have to acknowledge how impressive this all was. Square became well known for these box office smash hits, and they garnered themselves a reputation for pushing technology to its limits, while also offering good games to boot, for the most part. Simply put, we were eating good. And with the release of the hotly anticipated PlayStation 2 on the horizon, fans were salivating to see what the next generation of Final Fantasy had in store for us. And in 2001, we finally got to see the fruits of their labor. Final Fantasy X reminds me a lot of FF7, not because of any similarities with the games themselves, rather because of what they represent for Squaresoft as a company. FF10 pushed the franchise into never-before-seen heights, using the brand new technology that came with the dawn of the millennia to craft an experience like no other. And lo and behold, it just so happens to be one of the most liked games in the franchise. Fancy that. This game is special to me, to my friends, and probably you. So for today's video, we're going to be taking a deep dive and analyzing the impact and legacy of Final Fantasy X. But before I start, there are a few things that I want to make clear. Let's start with the most obvious one. Final Fantasy X has received many different ports and remasters over the years. However, for this video, I'm going to be sticking with the original North American PlayStation 2 release. I want to present the game in the context of when it came out. This means playing the original release on actual hardware. Sure, I'll be missing out on some international version changes and additional content, but the core of the experience is largely the same. Plus, I'm just not a big fan of the HD remaster in general because of how messy of a job it was, so for my own sake, I'll just be sticking with my PS2 copy. I'll be sure to highlight the differences in the international version as they become relevant to make up for that. The last thing that I want to mention is that this video is going to be full of spoilers. I want to give this game the full deep dive treatment, so as a result, I'm going to have to go into some specifics. FF10 is over 20 years old at this point and is widely available, so if you're at all interested in playing it, you have your options. With all that said and done, listen to my story. The game opens up, innocently enough, in a land called Xanarkand, a futuristic utopia that's garnered itself the nickname The City That Never Sleeps. It's got all the stuff you'd expect, but the main attraction here is the local sports game Blitzball. Think of it like a cross between water polo and soccer. The main protagonist of this story is an up-and-coming Blitzball player and star athlete of the Xanarkand Abes. While you can name this kid whatever you want, canonically this guy's name is... Um... Titus? What the fuck is that? Anyway, what makes TDM over here so special isn't just that he's good at what he does, since his dad is actually the professional blitzball player, Jack. Jack was so good at the game that he was basically seen as a hero to the people of Xanarkand, and armed with his signature shot, Jack reveled in the fame. However, ten years ago, Jack would suddenly leave Xanarkand, and no one has heard from him since. With that, people turned to his own flesh and blood to fill in the hole left by the legendary Blitzball player, which I'm sure isn't causing Titus to harbor any resentment towards him for. The past while has been pretty normal for the people of Xanarkand, but one night, all hell breaks loose during a big Blitzball game. A giant whale has appeared in the sky and has begun to attack Xanarkand. Titus is able to survive the initial attack on the Blitzball Stadium, and shortly after, runs into his guardian figure, Orin. However, the reunion is cut short, since during the chaos, Titus is sucked up into the monster, and when he comes to, the young man finds himself far from home. After gaining his composure, Titus is slowly drip-fed as to what exactly is going on here. It turns out that Titus 
Lucius is no longer in Xanarkand. Rather, he's in the mysterious land called Spira, and all signs point to him being 1,000 years in the future, with the old home Titus once knew being left in ruin. The monster that attacked his home is the malevolent being known as Sin. Sin has been terrorizing Spira for over a thousand years. The people believe this creature came into existence due to their abuse of advanced technology called Machina. Sin acts as a reminder for the atrocities they committed, and will go on to terrorize the people of Spira for the rest of time. However, there is a way to quell the beast. In the world of Final Fantasy X, summoners exist to go on a journey to collect these mythical creatures known as Aeons. Only by collecting all of the Aeons will the summoner be gifted the strength to kill Sin. But it isn't without any catches, as even if Sin is destroyed, he'll eventually return. But this drawback is seen as worth it to the people of Spira, so it's become a tradition of sorts for a summoner to embark on this pilgrimage. And the one chosen for this generation is a young woman named Yuna. But she's not alone, as Yuna is accompanied by a few guardians backing her up. There's the Blitzball player and devout Yevonite Waka, the cold and distant black mage Lulu, and the Ronsu of few words Kamari. With no other options, Titus tags along with Yuna and her guardians to hopefully find a way back home, but little does he know the hardships that they're all going to face. The opening hours of Final Fantasy X are chocked full of cutscenes and exposition. Some might even be tempted to call it overwhelming if they've never played the game before. And yeah, there's a lot to take in, I won't deny that. However, FF10 manages to avoid confusing the player by evenly spacing out this information in a way that feels digestible. What I just described to you isn't just a long, uninterrupted cutscene. Rather, all of this stuff is injected into the story in doses, and only when it becomes relevant. We learn about the conflict, the characters, and the story's goals, in a relatively short amount of time, and it's impressive at how well all of this is conveyed. What also helps is that we're just not watching cutscenes the entire time. Gameplay segments are sprinkled in to help keep the player engaged. However, it's in these micro doses of gameplay where I feel as though the opening of FF10 suffers a little bit. The main issue here is that they're very on rails and is a little too set piece heavy. While we are forced into a few tutorial encounters, they're all extremely gimmicky and are borderline scripted. You're told exactly what to do in each of these scenarios, and there's little to no risk in actually losing any of these fights. Even once you start getting party members, the game still does this, and it feels a little patronizing in a way. Like, I can't just be trusted to hit the X button a couple of times, and I instead need a detailed guide as to how killing monsters works. Come on, I'm an adult, let me figure it out myself. And for battles this complex, there isn't really much of an excuse. Thankfully, they ease up on the handholding not too long after you get your party members. But the scripted nature of these fights make the gameplay drag a little bit on repeat runs. But you know, I can forgive this on a first time playthrough. You always have to account that anytime someone picks up your game, that there's a chance it's going to be their first time experiencing the genre. The last thing you want is to alienate someone because mechanics are too complex right out of the gate. Sure, the handholding annoys me, but someone else might appreciate it. At the very at the very least, Square used this opportunity to really flex what they could accomplish with the PS2 hardware, because man does this game look good. While it's true that the PS2 was comparatively the weakest console out at the time, it was still a substantial leap from the original PlayStation. No longer would we have to be shackled by low poly 3D models, and instead, Square's vision could be fully realized with the power brought by the 6th generation. Environments are all packed to the brim with detail, character models are much more complex, and the animation budget has been increased tenfold. One of the aspects that Squaresoft was most proud of are the highly detailed face models. Instead of using plain textures, the faces in Final Fantasy X have a much higher poly count during cutscenes. This more accurate facial detail goes a long way in selling the emotions of the characters, making them feel all the more believable. You can really tell that they were proud of this since this is one of the first things you see when booting the game up. Sure, there are some parts of the presentation that have aged a bit, but back in 2001, this shit looked like real life, bro. You turn on your PlayStation 2 and you're instantly sucked into another world, not unlike our main hero and they somehow managed to compress this down all to a single DVD. Damn, not even the PlayStation 5 can do that! The last big upgrade to the presentation has gotta be the addition of voice acting. I get that it might sound a bit dumb nowadays, but having fully voiced characters was a big deal back then. So much so that Square even advertised this on the back of the box. And to give credit where it's due, it's some pretty ambitious stuff. Final Fantasy X is packed to the brim with voice acting, and for a campaign that spans almost 30 hours in length, the fact that nearly all of it is voiced is pretty impressive. There's some big name voice actors behind this project too. People like John DiMaggio, Tara Strong, fucking SpongeBob? They're a living, breathing, statistical impossibility. I've never seen a team this bad. 
There's a lot of ambition behind the voice acting, but it's when you talk about the quality of all of it when people's opinions start to get a little bit messy. There are a lot of people that love the voice acting in this game, and there's just as many that see Final Fantasy X as the prime example of bad English dubs. Nah, they're overreacting, the voice acting's fine. The issue with the voice acting isn't with the actors themselves, rather it boils down to the process behind how it was recorded. Since this is an English dub of a Japanese game made back in 2001, it's safe to assume that Squaresoft didn't exactly have a whole lot of money behind it. This means that instead of spending that cash to reanimate the lip movements to match the dub, the actors were instead instructed to match their lines to the cutscenes. This process is called ADR for those curious. Since the English language is so different compared to Japanese, trying to match up the dialogue is a tall task, and while they do a pretty alright job for the most part, it's undeniable that there's some issues. You'll be lucky to see accurate lip syncing of any kind, and you can tell when dialogue is sped up to match the Japanese cutscenes. It's not even subtle. I wanted to see Yuna's statue too, but I wanted to see it with Yuna by my side. I feel so bad for the voice actor of Titus, since he's the one that receives the brunt of this. James Arnold Taylor is a very talented actor. While I know him more for voicing Ratchet from Ratchet & Clank, Titus is one of his most iconic roles. He's received a lot of criticism for it over the years, and you know what? I think a lot of it is undeserved. It's easy to point and laugh at his… laugh, but it's surprising how many people miss the point of the laughing scene. Sure, remove from the context of the rest of the game and you can view it as a stilted, awkward, cringy laugh, but the thing about acting is that he's trying to sound like that. In the game, it's actually a pretty touching cutscene, but you know the internet. Once they've decided on something, that's just the way it is. At the very least, James seems to be a pretty good sport about the whole thing. <laughs> So yeah, Final Fantasy X was a pretty big leap in presentation. That's something I could use my eyes to see. But what about the gameplay? Surely that has remained unchanged from prior entries. Oh brother, believe you me, when I say that Squaresoft took full advantage of the PS2 hardware, I wasn't talking about the visuals. The gameplay of Final Fantasy X can be divided up into a few distinct facets. There's the combat, exploration, and the side activities. I want to focus on the battles first, since this portion of the game is the one that received the biggest glow up. Ever since Final Fantasy IV, the mainline FF games have been using the active time battle system. ATB has become basically synonymous with Square's RPGs at this point, and since it was introduced, every mainline game in the series has been using it. Sure, all of them have been putting their own spin on the ideas, but for six games in a row, the foundation of Final Fantasy's combat has remained the same. So here's the thing, between you and me, I'm not exactly the biggest fan of the ATB system. I mean, it gets the job done, but it lacks a lot of what I'd call a meaningful hook beyond some simple time management mechanics. You see people all the time talk about how they don't like turn-based games because of how much waiting around there is. And while it's easy to disregard what they say, I can't help but feel as though that criticism is founded in some regard. ATB is the poster child of this issue, since beyond having to wait for the meter to fill up, there isn't much that sets the system apart from standard turn-based combat. Sure, there are some interesting ideas present, like haste and slow magic, and some games even have attack charge periods, but for the most part, ATB feels tertiary. It's probably why the distinguishing factors of these old FF games were elements of customization and one or two battle mechanics. Regardless of my personal feelings towards the system, ATB was the winning formula back in the day, so why fix what isn't broken? But I'm sure after about 10 years of getting the same thing, people were starting to get a little tired of it. Plus, we're on the PlayStation 2 now, let's try to flex our stuff and come up with some new ideas for the next generation. And what Square ended up going with was the perfect decision. Combat in Final Fantasy X might look to be your standard affair from the outside looking in. Turn-based combat with a party of three members against a team of enemies. It's familiar stuff, but immediate difference right off the bat is that the ATB system has been completely removed in favor for the turn chart. Once your turn comes around on the chart, time basically freezes and you're allowed to instantly perform any action of your choosing. Turn order is dictated by multiple factors, ranging from your character's agility, whether or not haste or slow has been applied, or most importantly, the type of action used prior. Just because an action can be immediately performed once they're selected, not all actions have the same amount of cooldown on them. 
For example, attacking an enemy with your weapon has more cooldown than using an item or a special skill like cheer. Depending on that character's agility stat compared to the other participants in battle, that character can end up acting sooner than they otherwise would have before. There are even times when you can get away with using multiple actions in a row with the right setup. This sounds like it'd be a major pain in the ass to plan around, but thankfully there's a full turn order chart always available to the player, even updates in real time to show the future outcomes of a potential attack. This on its own is pretty cool, but what I like a lot about FF10's battle system is that it's a lot more interactive than what people give it credit for. Since every skill comes with different recharge time for your characters, you need to not only plan around what skill to use, but also the proper time to use it. Skills that come with bonus effects tend to be the ones that require the most amount of strategy. Delay attack and delay buster immediately come to mind when I think of this. These skills are inherently very useful since they, as the name applies, delay the action of an upcoming enemy susceptible to it. However, However, it's not without a few trade-offs. Not only do you need to have the MP to use the skill, but the cooldown you get from using Delay Attack is double that of a regular attack, and even longer with Delay Buster. You're essentially sacrificing that character's turn so that your allies have more chances to perform actions, and thanks to the turn chart, you're able to see the potential result prior to committing. Now this is pretty fucking rad. FF10 manages to double down on the strategic elements of combat, while also simultaneously remaining more hands-on than some of the other games. ATB is a pretty rigid system. The only way to make your turns more efficient is by mastering quick menuing and applying haste buffs. Beyond that, it's still a somewhat standard affair. FF10 offers more ways for the player to manipulate the turn order through smart, on-the-fly choices. If you want to heal, you might be better off tossing out an item rather than using magic. Not just because you'll be saving on MP, but because you'll get a chance to act sooner. But healing through items have some drawbacks of their own, due to how scarce some of them are compared to spells. These limitations are something they need to consider from the start of the game all the way up until the end, and that fact alone makes encounters more engaging to me in this game compared to some of the other Final Fantasies I've played. However, this is only a portion of what I like about the game's combat. For the past while now, the Final Fantasy series has been stuck with only using three party members at once, with FF9 being the exception. Final Fantasy X initially looks to be the same case, though as you'll quickly discover, this setup is only a formality. Sure, you only have access to three party members at once, but thanks to the power of the PlayStation 2, you're able to freely change your active party in the middle of a battle with the press of a button. There are little to no limitations with this system, since it doesn't take up that character's action, and you can even swap to a different member if you change your mind. This one a seemingly small addition to the gameplay completely opens up the combat system. Since you have access to every single party member at the same time, the amount of strategies you can come up with are near limitless. Constant character switching is not only encouraged, but it's also a requirement if you want to make the most out of your turns. Every character has a distinct role in battle, and all excel in at least one area. If you want to take out flying enemies, then you should use Waka. Elemental-based enemies are Lulu's specialty. Orin and Kamari have high strength stats and can pierce through armor, and Tidus can quickly beat down ground-based fiends with high evasion. The random encounters in Final Fantasy X almost act as a stat-based puzzle game. You need to pick the right characters to switch out at the right time if you plan on killing every enemy in a single round. Efficiency is heavily encouraged in Final Fantasy X, and while it might be a little too simple at the start of the game, the enemy formations quickly start to become more complex. You'll start to realize that some characters are effective against multiple kinds of enemies, and once that crosses your mind, the whole world becomes your oyster. While you might be tempted to just stick with a select few characters, FF10 encourages you to get everyone in on the action through the way its experience system works. Only party members that participate in the encounter will be able to earn experience. However, as long as they perform at least one action, it'll count. This means you can have someone run in to do an attack, heal, use an item, guard, or whatever. As long as they did something, they will earn experience. This is what I mean when I say encounters feel like puzzles. Sure, they aren't too bad if you just want to blast through them and be on your way, but if you want everyone to get a piece of the pie, then you need to think about how you approach things. The reason why this is so important is because the boss battles are designed with the full party in mind. Even if a character isn't useful for the entirety of the boss fight, it's a good idea to temporarily sub them in to perform one or two actions. Bring Titus to use some of his time magic. Waka can inflict a handful of status ailments. While not every boss is weak to every strategy, the point that I'm making is that there's always something for a character to do, even if you don't realize it. You don't want to get too switch happy either, since party members in your reserve can't be targeted for healing spells or buffs, so you'll have to make sure that you're confident in what you're about to pull off. 
mid-battle party switching is a complete game changer. And for their first and only crack at the idea, it's shocking at how well they managed to pull it off. It just goes to show that Square back then was more than just a one-trick pony. They weren't afraid to take risks with the way players could interact with their games, and they always went out of their way to try something new. Whether that be for better or for worse is certainly debatable, but you can't deny that there was always attempts to expand these games, with the most notable differences being in the character customization. Now this is the part that separates the men from the boys. While most Final Fantasy games share the same core foundation, what really separates them from a gameplay sense is the way the character customization is handled. Whether that be through equipment or other special means, the FF games always strive to let players alter the characters in whatever ways they want. And Final Fantasy X is no exception to this. Firstly, we have the literal equipment the characters use. Rather than weapons and armor having stats tied to them, equipment is instead dictated by their built-in abilities. Sure, some of them are your basic stat modifiers, but the overwhelming majority of equipment comes with some pretty interesting passives. You can inflict status ailments with attacks, get some emergency skills, eventually auto skills, equipment that affects your overdrive, and so on. Not too long into the game, you can even start crafting your own abilities to place on weapons. As long as there's a free slot to do so and you have the right items, feel free to go wild. I like the equipment in FF10 since it cuts right to the chase. It removes some of the, quite frankly, unnecessary aspects of equipment and rather focuses entirely on the good stuff. Every piece of armor or weapon that you find has a use that could potentially last for most of the game. You end up picking weapons based on what they can do in battle, rather than some superfluous attack stat, which is something that not a lot of RPGs do. I can only think of a handful of games where weapon abilities play a sizable role in the combat, and even then, it's not as much as in FF10. However, if Final Fantasy X is defined by one thing, then it would be the sphere grid. You see, you don't gain traditional levels in this game, rather you gain sphere levels. You can then spend these sphere levels to move around on the sphere grid, where you can then purchase stat points and abilities with spheres dropped by enemies. Sure, this sounds like leveling up with extra steps, and yeah, at the start of the game it is, but the sphere grid is actually a pretty cool system once you really get into it. Instead of characters having a sphere grid of their own, they all inhabit one massive sphere grid. They're all interconnected with each other, but are separated by locks. But, by using key spheres of the appropriate level, you can actually break those locks and venture into another character's path. Some super powerful skills are also only available via breaking locks, like Double Cast, Auto Life, and Ultima. This means that, technically speaking, any character can learn any skill. It'll just take longer for some characters depending on their current placement on the grid. But this is where some of the more situational spheres come into play. Spheres that are yellow or white colored can be used to quickly move one character around the sphere grid or remotely activate nodes. The effect you'll get is determined per sphere, and you can't undo the decision, so be sure to read the description before using them. Through careful planning and going out of your way to explore, you'll be able to quickly rack up some pretty unique loadouts for your characters. Give Yuna some offensive spells on top of her white magic, and fully take advantage of her high magic stat. Give a second character Haystega so you don't need to rely on Tidus to buff the team's speed. Sure, it takes a little bit of work to gain access to the ability to mix and match party builds, but the fact that Final Fantasy X still allows the player to do this despite the linear progression is welcomed. A character's utility in combat is completely defined by the sphere grid, but thankfully, even if you don't take full advantage of the system, the game does throw you a bone. Every character starts on their own unique branch of the sphere grid that defines their playstyle. If you really want, you can just follow these paths until the very end, only stopping to nab a few bonus nodes along the way. This should be good enough for the main campaign, but if you plan on doing any of the game's optional content, then you're going to need to expand your character's horizons a bit. There's no need to worry about bricking your character's progression either, since no matter how you slice it, getting extra stats and abilities is a good idea. Every character is viable in their own right by default, but if you want to make the most out of them, then you're going to have to put in some thought with the sphere grid. The prime example of this is with the character Kamari. If you were to ask anyone who's played Final Fantasy X before who their least used party member was, it would most likely be Kamari. As the resident blue mage of the group, Kamari has access to some pretty unique magic as his overdrive, some of which can be pretty good, like Mighty Guard. However, the reason why Kamari tends to be overlooked by players is solely because of his placement on the sphere grid. He's smack dab in the center of the grid, and because of this, he doesn't exactly have a unique path to go down of his own. 
While this means that you can technically build Kamari in any way you want, the fact of the matter is, it's too much of an investment to make this unit anything other than a poor imitation of someone else in the more dedicated roles. In the past, I've been pretty neglectful towards this character, and I remember barely using him during my first playthrough. But for this go around, I went on my way to try to make him work. I ended up discovering that Kamari's primary use as a party member isn't within the combat system. Rather, it's how he can be used to unlock a lot of the sphere grid single-handedly. What I ended up doing was sending Kamari down Riku's grid before jumping ship to Yuna's. This way I was able to unlock the holy spell much earlier than I otherwise would have. While this made Kamari an ultimately lopsided character with no real focus, his utility in getting other characters' skills made him a force to be reckoned with. But I can admit that he's still easily the weakest party member in the game since it requires way too much work to make him a viable pick. I can only think of a handful of times when Kamari was legitimately useful to me, and even then, that was mostly because he had access to steal and use. However, I think that this just further highlights just how versatile the sphere grid is. Every player has the potential to end up with completely different character builds by the end of the game. The only limitations are the amount of spheres you have and whether or not you're willing to break everyone's shackles. A player that fully understands the sphere grid is a force to be reckoned with, and the flexibility is the reason why it's one of my favorite progression systems in a game. However, this freedom doesn't come without a price. Final Fantasy X isn't a very challenging game. Sure, on a first time playthrough it can be pretty tough at points. I can remember a couple of bosses that gave me some shit, but going through this game again recently? Yeah, it's not that hard. The difficulty is fairly relaxed, I want to say. The normal encounters shouldn't give you too much trouble as long as you recognize what enemies are weak to and how to counter them. Make sure to give a couple of your guys the sensor ability in case you're having some trouble remembering. The only real source of challenge in the main campaign are the bosses, but if you've played this game before, you shouldn't have any troubles. Yes, that includes Seymour Flux, Eat My Ass. Despite FF10 being on the more relaxed side of challenge, it's at the very least the fun kind of relaxed. There's no optimal strategy that works on every encounter in the game, rather, you're instead rewarded for experimenting. And it's not as if the game is a complete walk in the park either, there are some intense fights that have a lot going on at once. The bosses on the airship immediately come to mind when I think of this. You have to either use Riku or Titus to command Sid to fly the ship towards the enemy or away from them. This allows you to avoid potential damage with the proper timing, but when you're pulled back, you need to rely on ranged attacks like Waka's Blitzball or Yuna's Magic. The Xanar can Ruin's fight is also pretty stellar, since it asks the player to switch around the positioning of their party members to minimize the amount of damage received from the counterattack. Unaleska is also one that catches a lot of people off guard. Not only is this a three-phase fight, but you need some party members to be undead if you want to avoid her instant kill attacks. But the catch with the zombie status is that healing spells and potions deal damage to the user, so you need to weigh up who should and shouldn't keep the status ailment. There are a lot of fun boss fights in this game, and they are without a doubt the highlight of the game's combat system. But if there was one part of the battles that I took issue with, it would be with the Aeons. Since Yuna is the dedicated summoner, her main form of damage is going to be with her Aeons. In previous games, summons were essentially just ultra-powerful spells to cast, but in FF10, Square decided to one-up themselves by making Aeons temporary party members. It's pretty cool to actually control a summon like Bahamut for a change. You even get access to their signature moves with their overdrives. The issues with Aeons is that they aren't very well balanced, both in terms of the game's overall difficulty and how they stack up compared to each other. For starters, current Aeons are usually outclassed by the time you get a new one. Ifrit is stronger than Valifor, and then by the time you get Ixion, they both become nearly useless. This chain goes on throughout the entire game, so by the time you have all five story-related Aeons, there isn't much reason to use any of them besides the strongest one. And no, elemental affinity doesn't count. It also doesn't help that some of the late game Aeons are disgustingly overpowered. Not only do their overdrives all do crazy amounts of damage, but they can also tank free hits for you. You're not punished for using an Aeon as a meat shield, so if you're about to get hit by a massive attack, then feel free to whip one out and just blast them away. This issue only gets worse if you decide to go after the optional end game summons, which snaps the game in two. In this playthrough, I barely used Aeons at all, which is funny considering how important they are to the game's narrative. In a way, it's kind of fitting that these mythical beasts are portrayed as all-powerful in the gameplay, but I think they just went a little overboard. I think something else that needs to be said is that I don't have any issue with this game being on the easier side. Like I said, FF10 is still a fun game for me to play, which is more important than being difficult. Imagine if this game sucked ass, but it was also hard as fuck for no reason. The obvious answer as to why the game is a little more on the casual side is because Square was going for mass appeal. They're trying to hook in the most broad audience they can with their game, so no better way 
way to do that than to make something more accessible. It also helps that they just sort of lied about what this game was actually like. I'm serious, look at old commercials for this game and you'll barely see any actual gameplay. It's as if the Western branch of Square was like super embarrassed that this is a turn-based game, so they tried their best to hide it. Like were they just hoping and praying that no one would get mad and return the game once the cat was out of the bag? 10 isn't the only game this happened to by the way. Square started doing this back when 7 was coming out. It's funny in retrospect because you just know people would lose their fucking minds if they bought this cool looking action game only to find out that it's basically Microsoft Excel. Final Fantasy X's combat has a whole lot of polish. It's easily the most refined and fleshed out aspect of the gameplay experience, which is good because it's what you're going to be spending the majority of your time doing. Believe it or not, there are some people that think the gameplay in your turn-based RPG doesn't matter, and while they're free to have those opinions and such, I will never understand them. If you're playing a game that's 40 hours long, and the majority of that time is spent doing battles and shit, the gameplay better be fun. I get that story matters too, and in some cases, it can be good enough to slog through repetitive combat. But like, we can have both. There are games out there that have good stories and good gameplay, believe it or not, and Final Fantasy X is absolutely one of them. At least when we're talking about core mechanics, because the gameplay outside of combat is noticeably less polished. Outside of combat, things are your standard JRPG affair. There's the overworld exploration, dungeon crawling, side activities, and minigames. In terms of the core level design, yeah, things are pretty linear this time around. I don't mean this in terms of story progression, because if that was the case, then every Final Fantasy game would be considered linear. Rather, I mean this in terms of the level design itself. Final Fantasy X has what a lot of people like to call hallway design. It's level design that, despite its fancy set dressing, is ultimately straightforward. To be blunt, one of the most criticized aspects of this game is just the overall lack of exploration during the main quest, and I get where they're coming from. The average FF10 level design, while offering a little bit of opportunity to branch out from the path, ultimately ends up being straightforward. There are even a couple of times where the areas you travel through are literal straight lines with no branching paths. Maybe there's a chest hidden here or there, but other than that, it's pretty straightforward. But to give 10 some credit, it's not as if you're just going from point A to B with no resistance. There are a couple of set pieces thrown here to spice things up a bit. Whether that be because of unique enemy encounters, story sections, or even full on mini games. But on the whole, yeah, it's pretty linear. I don't necessarily find this to be a bad thing personally, since I'm the kind of person that usually saves all the optional stuff until the end of the game for recording reasons. But I can understand how this could be frustrating to players used to some of the other games. Hell, sometimes it can be a little too much for me. Man, fuck the points of no return. This happens a couple of times throughout the game without warning, and the context doesn't even make sense. Go too far down the path and Titus will just decide to no longer go back. My least favorite one is in the Alped home, since you go through this door and it automatically locks behind you. So you better make sure you were thorough beforehand, because if you forgot anything, then it's gone for good. The only time the player is ever really tested in terms of their dungeon crawling abilities is in the Cloister of Trials. These puzzle filled areas act as mini dungeons of sorts, and they're required to beat the game. You usually do one of these before you unlock a new Aeon, but if you're thorough enough, you can actually score some pretty decent gear. People fucking hate this part of the game, but to be honest, I don't really find them to be all that bad. Sure, some of the puzzles can be a little annoying, or the solutions might be obtuse, but I don't find any of them bad. Yes, that includes the one in Bevel, fight me on that. The only trial that I find to be actually ass is the last one, funnily enough. Firstly, the puzzle relies mostly on memorization, so it's only a matter of trial and error until you solve it. But the real reason why it sucks is because you have to solve six of these puzzles, and every time you want to start a new one, you have to walk all the way back to the first room and push in a statue. It gets very tedious, and leaves such a bad taste in my mouth. Terrible last impression aside, I don't think these puzzles are all that bad. A little on the simple side, sure, but it works as a nice mix-up to keep me engaged. A lot of people like to dog on FF10's level design, and while they're valid in not liking it, I feel as though people ignore the reason why behind it. In the context of the story, the Summoner's Pilgrimage is treated kind of like a road trip. The characters follow this path walked on by many before them. They cross all these unfamiliar sites and are constantly reminded as to what they're fighting for. The characters are literally going from one area to another to collect the Aeons so that they can defeat Sin. 
It's a tradition that's been followed for thousands of years in Spira, so obviously it's been optimized to a T. My personal crackhead theory behind the linear level design is much more simpler. Back when the PS2 was new, there wasn't this one-size-fits-all engine that every game could run on. No one knew the limits of this brand new technology, so devs didn't quite know what they could get away with just yet. Maybe at the time, Square felt as though they reached the pinnacle as to what the PS2 could output, but that was clearly not the case, since Final Fantasy would only end up getting bigger as it chugged along. Unfortunately, this is something we'll probably never know the real answer to, since developers tend to be very tight-lipped about their projects. But this was just a personal theory I had. Anyways, it's not even as if Final Fantasy X is 100% always linear, since once you reach the end of the game and unlock the airship, that's when things really start to open up. With the airship, you're allowed to revisit areas you've already been to, or by piecing together some clues, you can fly to some secret areas to get some optional goodies. There's a handful of content to sink your teeth into if you really want to extend your playtime. You can grab all of the optional Aeons for Yuna, explore the bonus Omega Ruins dungeon and fight some optional bosses, or if you've really got nothing to do, you can tackle the mother of all side quests. The Monster Arena is the biggest time sink in the game, but in return, it offers the most amount of rewards. You unlock the Monster Arena once you've reached the Calm Lands, and by spending Gil, you can rematch any monster in the game. There are even a couple of exclusive battles here to win even more rare items. But the thing about the Monster Arena is that the right to fight needs to be earned. The only way to unlock battles in this area is by capturing fiends out in the wild. It's a pretty simple process. Just land the killing blow with one of these monster catching weapons and the fiend is yours for the taking. But the thing is, you're not going to unlock everything by just capturing one of every fiend. Oh no no no. If you want to unlock all of the optional bosses, you need to capture 10 of every available fiend in Spira. This includes some of the most painfully rare encounters you can find in the game. Oh sweet Jesus, don't even get me started on how long some of these guys took, and you have to do it 10 fucking times each for every enemy in the game. Do yourself a favor and use a spreadsheet for this crap, because I can guarantee you that you will lose count if you don't. This challenge is only for those willing to stick to the grind, but hey, you at least get some pretty cool rewards for doing so. Not only do you get multiple of some of the most rare items in the game, but you also unlock some of the toughest foes to take down. Manage to take them all down, and you just earned yourself the right to challenge the game's ultimate boss. In the original FF10, Nemesis was the final challenge that stood between yourself and 100% completion. It has the highest stats in the game and shouldn't be attempted without heavy investment in the sphere grid with multiple characters. Statistically speaking, Nemesis is the strongest encounter, but unfortunately, the fight itself is rather dull. Quick hit and haste are basically required, but the issue is that the fight boils down to dealing as much damage as possible, while also setting up contingencies for whenever he one-shots your party. For me, I'd use Riku to cast Super Mighty Guard since it casts Auto Life on the whole party, then just go to town with Quick Hit. This strategy made me basically unkillable as long as I had the proper items to spare. It's a rather disappointing secret boss if I'm being honest, and isn't worth the effort it takes to unlock him. I'm pretty sure Square agreed with this, since the international version of Final Fantasy X would go on to include a new slew of bosses to take on, alongside some general balance changes. There's the rebalanced Omega Weapon fight, the battles against the Dark Aeons, and the brand new Ultimate Boss Penance. Between you and me, I haven't done any of the international exclusive content before, but it's nice that there's more to look forward to the next time I play the game. Again, all current versions of the game are based off the international release, so you won't have to worry about that stuff. The only thing you do have to worry about is the prep work that goes into it. If you want to fully take on the monster arena and fight the toughest battles, then you need to have the right equipment to do so. This means getting every character's ultimate weapon, and oh boy. The celestial weapons in Final Fantasy X are amongst some of the most infamous Alta weapons in the entire franchise. Sure, they're crazy useful in combat, you'd be hard pressed to find anyone that disagrees, but the process of obtaining them is on a whole nother level. On top of finding the weapons themselves, you need to collect specific crests and sigils to power them up. A good handful of these are just hidden away in chests, so if you have a keen eye for exploration, you can get them no problem. But there are a good chunk of sigils that require quite the time investment in these, let's be real here, janky ass minigames. This was a major source of frustration for players back in the day, and while I won't say that they're great, I'll at the very least admit that the hate towards them is a little bit overblown. Sure, the choke of a race was annoying, and the red light green light game against the cactuars can get tedious, but I'll stand by the fact that these minigames didn't take too long for me to master. I can't imagine someone spending more than an hour on each of them at most, and I do appreciate that there is more thought into getting the best gear beyond doing basic tasks. 
However, the lightning dodging in the Thunder Plains is where I draw the line. This one can kiss my ass. The minigame itself is pretty simple. Press the X button when the screen flashes white, and congratulations, you've just dodged a lightning bolt. The issue with this minigame isn't that it's challenging. It's just so fucking tedious. To get the sigil used to power up Lulu's celestial weapon, you have to dodge 200 lightning bolts in a row. That's 200 straight dodges, and if you fuck up, then you have to start all over again. God forbid this happens when you're on your way to collect your prize. The worst part about all of this is that the game doesn't keep track of how many lightning bolts you've dodged. That shit has to be done by the player, and if you check the chest too early and are even just a little off, then that attempt just went down the drain. This minigame was by far one of the most stressful things I have ever done in a video game. Do yourself a favor and make sure you have a pen, paper, patience, and an item to disable random encounters. The last thing you want is to lose track and have to start all over again. But if you think any of these are bad, wait until you hear how you get Waka's ultimate weapon. Which means, yes, it's time to talk about Blitzball. <laughs> Ever since Final Fantasy VII, the franchise has been slowly introducing minigames that act as bonus content. In VII's case, it was the Gold Saucer and the plethora of bite-sized activities to take part in. Final Fantasies VIII and IX had fully fleshed out trading card games, and in VIII's case, people enjoyed that more than the actual game. But here's the thing, we're real gamers here at the Noms Compendium channel. We don't play doo-doo-ass nerdy card games, we only care about the good stuff. So if you like high-octane, adrenaline-pumping strategic sports simulations, then bro, do I have the game for you. Okay, so Blitzball is basically turn-based sports. You assemble a team of six players, and the point of the game is to score more points than your opponent. But don't think this is going to be a simple walk in the park, because there are a lot of different factors you need to consider. Because this is still technically a turn-based RPG, the stats of your players factors heavily into your success. The five main stats you need to worry about are passing, shooting, blocking, catching, and endurance. Every player has different stats from each other, and you can choose what position you assign them in depending on what they have going on. Blitzball games aren't as simple as comparing one player's stats to another, since there are some variables in place to shake things up. Passing and shooting gradually tick down while the ball is in the air, and if it hits zero before reaching the destination, then it's fumbled, or outright stolen in the case of an opposing player trumping the stat. But that doesn't mean everything is completely set in stone, since there is some variance at play here. At its worst, there's up to an 8 point variance. It mostly exists as a way to balance the game to prevent curb stomps. But, if you're at all worried about your shot being fumbled by this, you could always rely on one of your special moves. These actions take more HP to use, but come with some pretty good benefits. Not only does it increase your base stat of your action, but they can also have a chance of applying negative status ailments to your opponent. Which in some cases, is a better trade-off even if the ball is caught. Though at the end of the day, Blitzball is mostly a number game, with some positioning involved. In between matches, your players gain experience, and leveling up will increase certain stats. The number of special moves you can equip on your players will also increase every few levels. It's a good idea to get everyone in on a match so you can gain as much experience as possible, so a tip I can offer is to abuse the hell out of your character's special moves. You gain more experience this way, so even if you don't need it, it's a good idea to almost always go for those special shots. But, playing the game is only half of the story, since Blitzball has team management to it. To put it bluntly, the Besaid Aurochs kind of, well, suck. They have some pretty bad stats for most of their lifespan, so you're gimping yourself by investing time in them. Since I'm assuming you want to actually win some games, then you should think about replacing some members. It's a pretty simple management game, all things considered. Players are assigned at a fixed rate for however many games you want them to, and there's no fear of someone getting bought out. You also get the chance to rehire players as soon as their term expires. But if you let someone go, it shouldn't take you too long to find a replacement. You'd be surprised to find out how many people in Spirit are not only Blitzball players, but experienced enough to compete on a national level. Fucking no wonder why the Orox lost for 10 years straight. When some random guy in the street is better at catching a ball than Keepa, then you know you fucked up. Man, maybe Waka had the right idea. That's all you really need to know about Blitzball if I'm being honest. For such a seemingly simple and harmless minigame, you'd be surprised to see how much hatred there is towards it. Both back in the day and even now, if you were to ask 
someone what they thought about Blitzball, then you'd probably get a negative response. And I was definitely in the camp of not liking it that much. However, now that I've gotten the chance to sit down and actually invest a good amount of time into it, I think the hate towards it is severely blown out of proportion. Like, I get it's not for everyone, but come on guys, it's really not that bad. I don't think it helps that Blitzball makes a horrible first impression. I swear, that match you're forced to play against the Luka Goers is so heavily rigged against the player. Are you not supposed to win this or something? Because after all these years of playing this game, I still haven't done it. Why is it so hard? I wouldn't be surprised if this match alone left so many people with a bad taste in their mouth that they swore off the minigame since. It also doesn't help that the tutorial for Blitzball is just awful. I mean, look at this list and tell me that this was the best way of handling things. What's especially funny to me is that aside from this match, Blitzball isn't a hard minigame. It's quite the opposite actually. Once I got some of the better members on my team, I was curb stomping guys left and right, having upwards of a 10 point advantage. If you plan on investing any time into Blitzball, make sure you earn Titus' Jack Shot as soon as possible. On top of increasing his base shot power, using the Jack Shot will instantly knock out two defending players. Use this next to the net and enjoy a free goal 90% of the time. Sure, at the start of your blitzing career, you might only be able to do this one or two times, but since you gain exponential HP increases as you level up, you'll eventually reach the point where you can pull this off multiple times in a game. Something that's pretty disappointing about Blitzball's difficulty is that the opposing teams eventually fall super far behind in terms of stats. As long as you stick to using the same players every game, you'll eventually overpower them, to the point where only a few select players will give you a hard time. Even then, it's not like it's that much more challenging. A lot of my Blitzball games ended up with me using the same strategy over and over. Pass the ball to Titus, get him close to the net, use the jack shot, and 9 out of 10 times, the ball would go in. There's no evolution as to how you can approach Blitzball games, and in that sense, the activity does get a little boring after a while. The reason why this is such a big deal is because you have to play so much fucking Blitzball if you want to max out Waka's potential in combat. Not only is a piece of his ultimate weapon locked behind the game, but also every single one of his alternate overdrives. But the thing about getting all these rewards is that they only show up in the league and tournament one at a time, so if you want everything, then be prepared to blitz your heart out. It's weird because of how much grinding you're required to do if you want to get all the rewards, I actually find Blitzball to be a pretty fun game all things considered. It's not the most complex sport in the world, but it's commendable how much time and effort went into this piece of optional content. For the average player, Blitzball is just this one and done minigame you play for a single time in the story and never touch again. But for those whose interest was captured by that opening game, then there's a surprising amount of meat to this activity. Honestly, if this game received a little more polished difficulty and content wise, I can see Blitzball being released as a standalone mobile game or something. Yeah, imagine a world where you can include any major character from the series on your Blitzball team. You laugh now, but wait until you see the sick shit Sephiroth would pull off. Final Fantasy X has some pretty stellar features on offer. While not all of the content is polished, I believe that it nails the landing where it counts. The core experience, the stuff that most players are going to experience, is pretty meaty on its own, and I can't imagine someone walking away from it feeling dissatisfied. It's just some of the bonus content surrounding it that leaves a little bit to be desired. A lot of the really cool features tend to overstay their welcome. You don't just have to play Blitzball, you need to live and breathe Blitzball. You don't need to capture some monsters to unlock the super boss, you need to capture 10 of every monster and defeat all of the unique encounters just to get a pretty boring super boss, all things considered. There is a lot of content in this game that is worth experiencing. The only issue is that the prep work it takes to unlock said content is very draining. This is probably the reason why the HD version of the game includes a speed up feature. I was ready to fight the final boss about 35 hours in, but over doubled that time doing a bunch of other stuff. I can at the very least say that this content is worth doing at least once in your life, but it's not really a grind that I would want to do again anytime soon. At the very least, a lot of this content is tied to one of the best turn-based combat systems you can find. It manages to elevate a lot of the busy work into content that's worth doing, so good on them. FF10 has some very solid gameplay at the end of the day, and it's worth experiencing for that alone. But nah, not many people play RPGs for the gameplay I'm aware. If you're playing a 40 hour game, then you better have a good narrative backing it up, and thankfully, Final Fantasy X more than delivers on that front. On the surface, Final Fantasy X follows a group of heroes working together to save the world from a benevolent god. It's a classic hero's journey filled to the brim with action, adventure, mystery, and romance. 
However, what Final Fantasy X's narrative also works to do is deconstruct the religion within the game's world. The teachings of Yevon are so much more than just a backdrop for the game's narrative, since their belief and influence within society plays a large part in how the story plays out. Sin is a symbol of death for Spira. Wherever it goes, death is sure to follow. While the people of Spira try their hardest to take Sin down, ultimately, it's all in vain. Sin is eternal, so no matter how many summoners Spira throws at the monster, it will always come back. The people of Spira, more specifically, the followers of Yevon, believe that Sin's return is only brought on because the people of the world have yet to repent for their past mistakes. While the calm window brought by the summoner's sacrifice is brief, the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. So yeah, the situation with Sin is kinda fucked, but wait until you hear what our beloved figureheads are up to. The teachings of Yevon mean a lot to the people of Spira. Beyond just being the main religion people follow, the maesters of Yevon also have a lot of political influence. A surprising amount in all honesty. It would be like if the church was in charge of our laws or something. What this results in is a society with a fairly limited worldview. The citizens of Spira are so desperate for any kind of hope against Sin's wrath that they're willing to blindly follow whatever their leaders tell them to, regardless of what it might be. One of the core beliefs of Yevon is that we as a society need to swear off the use of Machina. It's believed that Sin's arrival is tied to the abuse of this advanced technology, and according to the teachings, the only way to permanently rid the world of Sin is for the people of Spira to atone for their past actions. What this means is that the people of Spira live much more humble lives than the ones Titus is used to seeing in Xanarkand. The religion in FF10 isn't as black and white as you might initially think it is. The church is evil is a classic trope in fiction, and yeah, FF10 does lean heavily into that idea. I mean, it wouldn't be the first or last time the Final Fantasy series was on the side of anti-authority, but FF10 manages to capture a much larger spectrum than the previous games in the series. Religion is Spira is less black and white, and more so a gradient. The overwhelming majority of people are disciples of Yevon, however, the way they uphold their religion differs between individuals. We see a wide variety of takes on Yevon's teachings all throughout Spira, and while they all uphold the same general ideas, the little differences in how it's presented goes a long way in making this feel like a living, breathing world. However, at the end of the day, FF10 is still a game about critiquing the status quo. While the positive aspects of Yevon's teachings are there, it's pretty obvious that this group is being ran by some pretty corrupt individuals. This is something that the game doesn't even try to hide. On top of the less than trustworthy figureheads, Yevon's teachings promote some heinous things like human sacrifice, rejection of progress, and even discrimination. No better is this demonstrated than with the Albed. The Albed go against everything that Yevon represents. The teachings of Yevon's are very traditional. They believe in long-established rules and ideas that everyone needs to uphold. However, the Albed are the opposite. They openly use Machina to further advance their society, and in a world where the use of that technology is seen as forbidden, it doesn't exactly sit all too well with the majority. What this results in is the Albed being discriminated against by devout Yevon followers. The Albed are actively shunned and villainized throughout the story, and there's no better demonstration of this than with, surprisingly enough, our main party. The character Waka is is the prime example of a Yevon meat rider. He's dedicated his entire life to strictly following their teachings and traditions. However, he makes his disdain towards those he perceives against Yevon very clear. He goes on and on over the course of story about how much he loathes the Albed and how they're the source of all of Spira's problems. The religious zealot is a common story trope and is largely used as a way to demonstrate how corrupt the faith in question is. Any piece of media that's focused on the occult heavily relies on this concept. Something that you might notice, however, is that many of the examples you can find using this writing choice don't tend to go into how someone can end up developing these toxic mindsets. While Waka's mindset and worldview at the start of the game is undoubtedly wrong and isn't something that should be defended, it's not exactly unfounded from his perspective. Waka was someone who was raised on the teachings of Yevon. Their core values were drilled into his head at a young age. Since we've already established that Yevon viewed the Albed as the root cause of everyone's problems, it's only natural that Waka would feel the same way. Since the Albed are attributed with the return of sin, any and all chaos caused by the monster is associated with that group, regardless of how unfounded that hatred is. An aspect of Waka's character that's usually glanced over is how he struggles to cope with the loss of his younger brother, Chapu. Chapu was Waka's only family after their parents died, and since they had no one else, Waka had to step up to the plate and act as the father figure of sorts for his brother. They had a very tight bond, and were even competing in blitzball tournaments with each other. However, these good times didn't last forever. Sometime before the start of the game, Chapu would volunteer to join Spira's army and was tragically killed by Sin. 
The loss deeply affected both Lulu and Waka, but between the two, it's safe to say that Waka took the news much harder. Waka struggles with these feelings of loss and has no idea how to properly move on from what happened. Our first glimpse of this is in his relationship with Titus. Waka takes a liking to our fish out of water and is quick to take him under his wing. While it initially seems as though he's doing it out of the kindness of his heart, it's eventually revealed that it's because Waka is using Titus to fill the hole left behind by Chapu. Once this is established in the narrative, the realization sets in. Waka has abandonment issues and is trapped in the grieving period for his late brother. Since Sin's wrath is linked to the beliefs of the Al Bed, it doesn't take much effort to put two and two together. Waka's grief, combined with Yevon's traditionalism, is the source of this bias against the Al Bed. While Sin is the cause of Chapu's death, to Waka, the Al Bed play an equal part. When taking all of that into account, there's a certain level of empathy to be found within Waka's character during this period. But the game is more than happy to remind you that, grieving or otherwise, there is no excuse for discrimination. Waka's character growth is done extremely well, since he's the party member that struggles the most with accepting the fact that Yevon's teachings are corrupt. He's someone who's had their entire worldview turned upside down, and once he realizes that yes, he is in the wrong, he tries his best to make amends. Waka's purpose in the narrative of Final Fantasy X is to show the absolute extreme of what Yevon's followers are capable of doing, and by giving him such a large role in the story and constantly reminding us of his stance, it plants the idea in our minds that maybe, just maybe, there's something terribly wrong with our religion. I believe the reason why FF10 puts a large emphasis on this part of the world is for the sake of broad appeal. Religion is a universal concept that everyone in our real world can understand. Regardless of whether or not you practice religion yourself, it's hard to deny that it isn't so heavily intertwined in everyone's culture. Putting it at the front and center of Spira gives us, as outsiders, something immediately familiar to grasp onto. Spira is a mythical land filled with all sorts of creatures and concepts that we couldn't dream of having in our real world, but those small splashes of the contemporary helps ground FF10's world. Either that or the hours of Blitzball are finally getting to me. While the religious side of Spira plays a massive part in Final Fantasy X, at the end of the day, it mostly serves as a backdrop for the characters. Of course, I already mentioned Waka, but the rest of the party is occupied by some pretty diverse characters. Most of them come from all different walks of Spira. However, not all of them play a massive part in the game's narrative. Don't get me wrong, they are fleshed out and well-defined characters. Most of them even get a moment in the spotlight, but it's clear that the writers had their favorites. Something that a lot of people don't understand is that character development is not limited to characters changing over the course of the story. There are many other ways to develop characters, but the modern media discussion mindset has been pretty narrow-minded. Everything has to follow one set of rules and there is no room for other methods of storytelling. Yeah, okay. Every major character in Final Fantasy X is developed, but not every character has an arc. Lulu starts and ends in roughly the same state. The only difference is that she's able to open up more to her comrades and has full knowledge of the corruption behind Yevon. While you could argue that this makes her lesser than some of the other characters, ultimately it doesn't benefit the conversation behind FF10's narrative. Lulu has a purpose in the story and she serves that purpose well. The same is true for Riku and Kamari as well. There is nothing wrong with wanting more out of a certain character, but calling them underdeveloped because of it is a little silly. I think my favorite supporting character in the game is Orin. He's the badass mentor figure of the group. The man of little words whose past is shrouded in mystery. Damn. Sure, that sounds pretty typical for an RPG, but Orin ends up being one of the more compelling characters to me. His character is primarily meant to assist Titus' development, as he has an extensive relationship with Jekt. However, we eventually learn that Orin is a man filled with many regrets. He's on a journey of atonement and is the spark that gets everyone in the group to start really questioning the practices of Yevon and the true meaning of the pilgrimage. In a sense, the party's main purpose isn't so much to go on their own journeys, rather they work to flesh out certain aspects of Spira and its culture. We have a follower of Yevon, a scavenger with Albed heritage, a Ronsa warrior from the mountains, and so on. Even Seymour, who is extensively the main antagonist of the game, is meant to represent corruption in the government. He pulls the strings behind the scenes and orchestrates events in a way to further tighten Yevon's grip on society. One of the most standout moments is when he allows the Crusaders to use Machina against Sin, knowing full well that it'll be ineffective. Seymour purposely sacrifices innocent lives so he can continue to fearmonger the people of Spira and further push his political influence. 
While Seymour has much bigger ambitions beyond this, I honestly feel as though his character works the best when it's confined to his position as a political figure. Once the facade is dropped and his true goals are in view, I feel as though he becomes a lot less interesting as a villain. Still a compelling one, but we already have so many big bad guys that want to take over the world in RPGs. The more grounded idea of a corrupted political figure is just more impactful and unique I feel, but it's whatever. It's not like this is even the main focus of the story anyway. The main story of Final Fantasy X is the one that follows the relationship of our two main leads. Titus and Yuna are, without a doubt, the most fleshed out and important part of the game's narrative. The connection they share with each other goes hand in hand with how they develop and grow as people. Titus initially starts off as a very self-centered person, however it's through his interactions with Yuna that he begins to care more about the people that he's forced to be around. The same applies to Yuna in a slightly different circumstance. She starts the game off as a very timid and passive person. She initially begins the pilgrimage not out of her own free will, but because it's the summoner's duty to do so, knowing full well of the sacrifices and trials that will be along the way. While this undoubtedly makes her a very courageous woman, Yuna's core flaw is that she's ultimately someone who is very passive. But this is where Titus comes in. His hot-headedness and carefree attitude in most scenarios helps Yuna understand that you're the only one to dictate your own life. He acts as the catalyst that spurs her into eventually denouncing the pilgrimage and looking for a better and permanent way to rid the world of sin. What also helps to make their relationship believable is that the two share a lot of chemistry. Both of these characters deal heavily with the pressures of expectations. They're the legacies left behind by their fathers, and now they're both expected to follow in the same footsteps. The two being able to relate to each other on such a fundamental level helps make their eventual romance feel all the more natural. What also assists this are the scenes dedicated to the characters comfort each other in their time of need. All of this culminates in a beautiful scene where our two leads share a display of passion. A brief moment in the chaos when they're able to forget about the hardships and only focus on each other. And this callback to an earlier scene is the icing on the cake. Final Fantasy X is a pretty loaded game from a story standpoint. There's a lot to dissect from a literal plot standpoint, and also in terms of the meta-narrative. For example, the theme of loss is common throughout the game. Every character has lost someone or something important to them, and their journey through Spira allows them to confront those emotions and eventually overcome them, both figuratively and literally. However, if there's one character that I think needs to be highlighted more than anything, then that would be our main character. Titus is one of the most polarizing characters I've seen in an RPG. People fucking hate this kid, and I have no idea why. So I'm gonna step up to bat and defend Titus, because he's a lot more layered and interesting than people give him credit for. Titus is a fish out of water protagonist, and because of this, he serves two purposes. The first one is to naturally introduce concepts about the world of Spira to the player. Secondly, by being a fish out of water, he's able to make an active change in the world since he's able to bring an outsider's perspective to everything. A common complaint I see about Titus is that he can be pretty whiny, and while it's true, I've never understood why this is a bad thing. Something that people tend to forget is that this character is around 17 years old, and it's clearly demonstrated that he's not the most emotionally mature person out there. He's kind of an asshole, is super self-centered, and takes people's help for granted. I don't really blame him for being like this either, because I sure shit wasn't the most emotionally developed person either at that age. So when Titus is ripped away from the life he knew, and suddenly finds himself in a foreign land, I can understand why he's as brash as he is. I think his attitude towards the situation, and his emotional response to it all, is totally reasonable. And it's not as if he stays like this for the whole game. Titus's character growth comes from him developing his relationships, not just the one that he shares with Yuna, but also the one he has with his abusive father. I mentioned him briefly at the start of the video, but Titus's father is the world-renowned Blitzball star Jack. Jack was the king of Xanarkand. He had the talents, the looks, the courage, and was all in all seen as a hero to those around him. However, the dark truth about Jack is that he was a crippling alcoholic. Once you're at the top, there's no reason to try anymore after all. Jack used liquor as an escape from the pain of monotony. However, this self-destructive coping mechanism has a price. Not only did his career take a massive hit, heavily damaging his ego, but his pent-up rage manifested in verbal abuse towards his son. Jack was already someone who struggled to communicate with Titus. He'd constantly berate him, telling Titus that he would never be good enough to live up to his impossibly high standards. While Jack saw this as an act of tough love, regardless of his intentions of trying to toughen up the kid, this was abuse. Jack was a horrible father to Titus, to the point where he began to have reoccurring nightmares of the torment he went through. 
This, coupled with being neglected by his own mother, led Titus to rightfully resent his dad. However, even after Jack's supposed death, the nightmare continued as we learn early on that Sin and Jack are one and the same. While the game goes into the specifics of how this works later on, this fact is revealed to us not too long into the journey. I believe the purpose of this was to not only give Titus a personal stake within the narrative, but to also further lay into the idea that the main conflict of his character is Titus learning to confront and overcome his abusive father. A running theme of Final Fantasy X is the idea of family expectations. This is actually established at the very start of the story. The people of Xanarkin looked up to Jack and saw him as a hero, and in his absence, Titus was the one left responsible to fill in the void left behind. As you can imagine, these expectations come with a lot of pressure. Titus works tirelessly to not just live up to the legacy that Jack left behind, but to prove himself to be better than his father. Titus hates Jack more than anything. He's the main source of his self-doubts, and that childhood trauma has stuck with him for all of this time. All this begins to surface when it's revealed that Jack is the current incarnation of Sin. This fact completely shatters Titus. To the people of Spira, Sin serves as a reminder to all their past misfortunes. However, to Titus, Sin represents his own trauma. By overcoming Sin, Titus can overcome the hardships he faced in the past. I'll be honest, I find Titus to be a very relatable character. I've had a pretty rough relationship with my own dad in the past. Obviously not to the extent that Titus did with Jack, but I know what it's like to have expectations placed on you because of who you're related to. I'm about to get a little real here for a second, so bear with me. Growing up, I felt this overwhelming pressure to be just like my own dad. I was expected to follow the same career path as him, even though I made it clear that I had my own ambitions. I didn't want to be what someone else wanted me to be. I wanted to do something that I was passionate about, but the tension didn't go away. Making YouTube videos isn't really seen as the most respectable career choice, and I sort of get that to an extent. With the amount of problems this platform has, who wouldn't be worried about it all suddenly going up in flames overnight? But the issues that I was facing, and still do to some degree, is that I felt as though I wasn't being taken seriously by my family. Like all that I've done was just a phase and that at some point I'd wake up and realize that I'm just wasting my time and that I should get a real job like my dad. To be honest, that hurt. It still hurts sometimes. It's as if all my hard work and commitment was irrelevant because I'm still expected to be someone I'm not. It's because of that that I'm able to see a little bit of myself in Titus. I'm able to understand and sympathize with a kid who yearns to earn the approval of those around him. I'm sure a lot of people out there struggle with feelings of self-doubt and wanting nothing more than to earn the respect of their parents. As much as I want to act like I have everything together, I really don't. There's a lot that I don't know about in regards to the real world, and it's a little scary to think about. I wouldn't be surprised if this aspect of Final Fantasy X's narrative was included due to the developers behind the project feeling the same way. Back then, video games were mostly seen as kitty shit, or something that you should be embarrassed to be interested in. I can only imagine how much worse it was as someone who worked in the industry at the time. Your entire career basically treated as a joke because you weren't in one of the more respected lines of work. I know it sounds a little unfair to say that I like Titus mostly because I can connect with him, but sometimes, having a deep understanding of a protagonist's mindset helps you resonate more with them. Some people relate to Cloud Strife because of his crippling insecurities and wanting to belong. Some people connect with Squall because of his abandonment issues. I'm able to relate with Titus because I know what it's like to have rocky relationships, and a pressure to live up to certain expectations. While it would have been easy to just end it there and have a compelling character, the writers actually go out of their way to really flesh out the relationship between Titus and Jekt. It isn't just as simple as, Jekt is a bad person, because there is a hell of a lot more nuance to his character if you're willing to look for it. Titus has every right to feel the way he does about Jekt, because he was a bad father, an alcoholic, and emotionally abusive. However, what Titus learns throughout his journey through Spira was that his view of Jekt was extremely limited. Titus only knew his dad at his lowest point, but what he didn't know was the journey of self-discovery Jekt went on after arriving in Spira himself. Scattered all over the world are spheres left by Jekt, chronicling his time there. It turns out that Jekt partook in a summer journey of his own. He acted as the guardian to Yuna's father, Braska, alongside Orm. Jekt being removed from the fane that defined him, and being isolated from his family, gave him the opportunity to reflect on what had become. Jekt is able to recognize that he was a terrible father to Titus, and while he was unsure if he was ever going to see his son again, he begins a journey of self-improvement. 
Jack gives up drinking and adopts a more selfless attitude. By the time the pilgrimage comes to an end and a guardian needs to be sacrificed to create the final Aeon, Jack has no issue with forfeiting his own life for the cause. While this would inadvertently lead him into being the new vessel for Yu Yevon, Jack's self-sacrifice here just shows how much his time and spirit changed him. His only regret was not being able to see his son for one last goodbye. Most of this information is tucked away in optional content that's left up for the player to discover on their own. If you were to ask me, this stuff is mandatory viewing if you want to get the most out of Jack's character. Viewing all of the Jack spheres and really diving into the meat of what's going on between him and his son unravels a much more complex relationship than it otherwise would have been. The best part about all of this though, is that the game doesn't actively try to redeem Jack's actions. No matter how you slice it, Jack was a bad father, which did severely impact Titus's mental state. The game doesn't treat Jack as a misunderstood character, rather, they present him as a layered one. Titus is still 100% justified in how he feels towards his dad. Dad? Yeah. I hate you. This entire scene between Titus and Jack is one of the best written interactions in the entire game. The amount of nuance in this scene is outstanding. You've really grown. Yeah, but you're still bigger. There is just so much to impact in these words alone. Sure, this can be taken literally, with how Titus is much older than he was when Jack last saw him, but there's a secondary meaning of Titus' character growth. He's become much more brave and selfless than he was as a kid. However, Titus' response enforces the idea that to himself, he still hasn't lived up to his father's standards. The years of pent-up aggression and trauma finally boil over once Titus comes face to face with Jack. While Titus understands his father more, he still can't forgive him for everything that happened. However, when push comes to shove, ultimately, there's still a part of Titus that loves his father. The way he desperately reaches out to him one last time before they battle, and how he's in tears once Jekt is defeated says it all, really. Titus can't forgive Jekt, but he understands him better now. This is one of the most human relationships I've ever seen portrayed in fiction. People are complicated, emotions can sometimes be hard to understand, good people can do bad things and learn from it, but this doesn't mean that the people affected by those actions have to forgive them, and from Titus' perspective, he can say all he wants how much he despises his father, but there's still a part of him that deep down still cares about him, enough so that he's brought to tears when it's finally over. <laughs> I hate you, Dad. The dynamic between Titus and Jack is one that I think about a lot. Whenever I do some reflection on my feelings towards this game, this aspect of the story always creeps its way into my mind, and I somehow find more ways to appreciate it than I did before. It took me a while to realize this, but Titus and Jack go on basically the same journey and grow in similar ways. As much as he'd deny it, Titus is a lot like his dad. Both of them are star athletes that were whisked away into a mysterious world. They go on a journey with a summoner, on a quest to rid the world of sin. Through this journey, they learn more about themselves and are given time to reflect on the relationships they have with the ones closest to them. In Titus' case, while he didn't have much explicitly wrong with him as a person, he does grow. I already mentioned he confronts and overcomes his feelings of abuse, but a large chunk of this story is dedicated to having Titus mature as a person. He goes from a self-centered and whiny teenager to a respectable young adult with a support group that he's willing to do anything for. All of this culminates in him eventually making the ultimate sacrifice. To make a long story short, the one responsible for Sin's return is a powerful summon named Yu Yevon. It turns out that the Xanarkand Titus and Jekt are from is a dream conjured by the Faith. The real Xanarkand lies in ruins because of a war that broke out a thousand years ago. Yu Yevon wanted to preserve the dream of his utopia. So he gathered the survivors from the war and had them dream an exact copy of Xanarkand. This includes replicating the people. However, this alone wasn't good enough for Yu Yevon. He wanted to get revenge for what happened, and in an act of retaliation, he created Sin. But as the years went on and Yu Yevon lost all consciousness, Sin eventually became a malevolent being that exists for the sole purpose of protecting Dream's Anarchand. The only way to permanently rid the world of Sin is to destroy Yu Yevon, but this will come at the cost of Dream's Anarchand and all of its inhabitants to cease existing. This includes Titus. There's actually some pretty clever foreshadowing done for those with very keen eyes. You know how you can name Titus whatever you want? Sounds like some typical RPG stuff. However, you're also given the opportunity to name any of the Aeons you unlock. 
Since Dream Xanarkand is basically just a massive Aeon, being able to name Tidus hints at him not being real as well. It's not super important, I'm aware, but I just thought it was pretty neat. The final act of the game acts as the ultimate demonstration of Tidus' growth as a character. His journey through Spira greatly expanded his horizons, and gave him the chance to finally grow up. Back in Xanarkand, Tidus was living without a purpose of his own. He existed solely to fill in the void left behind by his father. But by going to Spira and meeting all of these new faces, Tidus was finally able to find his own reason for living. He found the place where he truly belonged, and was able to find real happiness. It's because of those experiences that Tidus is able to find the courage to face his darkness, and take his life back into his own hands. The defeat of Yu Yevon symbolizes the completion of his transformation, even though it came with the greatest cost. Way to go, kid. You finally made your old man proud. Final Fantasy X is a beautiful game. If you made it this far into this video, then I'm pretty sure you at least agree to some extent. The core mechanics are flexible and offer many different ways to tackle any situation. The polished and visually stunning presentation were absolutely mind-blowing back in the day, and the amount of content was sure to keep any player busy for hours on end. If we were to look at Final Fantasy X from all those standard video gamey checkboxes, then this game would be a must-play for any fan of RPGs. However, it's in its story and characters where the game goes beyond the niche player base, and becomes something that I think anyone with even a semblance of interest in the medium should experience at some point. It's a game that has a well-deserved community of some of the most passionate fans I've seen. It's hard to deny that this game left an impact on so many players, and has some of the strongest staying power I've seen from the PlayStation 2 era of gaming. But at the same time, Final Fantasy X represents the end of an era for the days of classic JRPGs. This was one of the last games released by Square before the merger with Enix, and since then, it's safe to say that this isn't the same company anymore. Final Fantasy hasn't been the same since X came out. Not in the sense that this game completely changed the course of the series, rather this is the last time Final Fantasy was a traditional RPG. The series has gone almost a complete metamorphosis since then, and while there's nothing wrong with old dogs trying new tricks, it feels like some of these changes were made for the sake of mass appeal more than anything. I get that Final Fantasy has always tried to appeal to the mainstream to an extent, but it never felt as though these decisions impacted the game's creative voice. I look at games like 15 and 16 and get this overwhelming feeling of cynicism from it, with mechanics and design that feel a little embarrassed of the franchise's RPG roots. Like, these games can't be taken seriously by the public unless they're these grand open-world action games with plenty of quick-time events and automation. Maybe it's just me being sick of modern games at this point, but being able to go back to a simpler time when games weren't afraid of being themselves just feels so refreshing. This isn't nostalgia talking either, since I've made it pretty clear why this game is pretty special to me and a lot of people. Final Fantasy X, while groundbreaking at the time, now stands as a time capsule for the good old days. Before the series would abandon almost everything that made it stand out, FF X was the culmination of every lesson learned from the previous games. This was meant to be the ultimate Final Fantasy experience, a true next-gen entry that blew away audiences with fun gameplay, a great story, and groundbreaking technological advances. While those days seem to be long behind us, I know for a fact that the impact of Final Fantasy X won't be forgotten by me and everyone else who's played it. They don't make them like they used to. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. I'd like to give a special shout out to all of my channel supporters whose names are on screen now. It's because of these generous people that videos like this are possible. I really mean it. For this video, I needed to purchase a brand new capture card because my old one didn't support interlaced video. Without it, I would have had to rely on the HD remaster of FF10 for this video, which would have gone against the idea of looking at this game in the context of when it came out. However, it's because of my channel supporters that I was able to afford this expense and make this video the way I wanted to. I can't thank everyone enough for the support, and I'll be sure to make good use of this equipment in the future. If you're at all interested in supporting the channel, there are a few perks I can offer in return, but the main thing you'll be doing is providing me with financial security and freedom. With the way YouTube is now, I'm a little worried with experimenting with my content. This is my job after all, so I need to make sure I make a certain amount of money per month if I want to keep doing this full time. 
What this means is that I'm currently forced to keep my topics to a very limited range to guarantee a certain amount of views per upload. There's a lot of games that I want to talk about, however it would be a big risk doing that since if I dedicate too much time to those projects, I might not make enough in return for it to be viable. Sponsors do help and while I have gotten a few in the past, it's not something that I can rely on always getting, you know? This is why stuff like Patreon and channel memberships are so important to this channel. There's a lot that I want to say about certain games, but I know that some of these topics have too limited of an appeal to make a return. However, if I had a few more people supporting me monthly through channel memberships and Patreon, I would be able to branch out into those topics without fearing too much as to how it would impact my channel and YouTube's algorithm. So if you want to support long form content like this, then please consider checking out my Patreon or becoming a channel member. Check out the link in the description or pinned comment to get started if you're interested. In terms of future projects, things are currently up in the air as of right now. Persona 3 Reload is coming out soon, and I'm looking forward to talking about that on the channel. But in terms of the next video, I'm going to need some time to think about it. I at least want to take some time off, because I'm feeling a little burnt out after all of this Final Fantasy talk. However, if you want to stay up to date with what I end up doing next, feel free to follow my Twitter and join my Discord server. Both will be linked in the description. Once again, I'd like to thank you all so much for watching, and I hope to see you all next time.